Uh, one has been FBI abuse of power as an organization that was uh, originally created to oppose the House on american Activities Committee. J. Edgar Hoover authorized a series of counterintelligence programs against us that were so egregious they were mentioned in the Church Committee, believing that any steps to abolish HUAC would lead to the abolition of the FBI. Uh, as early as the 19, late 1970s, we were testifying before the Senate, uh, raising concerns that the Espionage Act could be used against publishers uh, in the next Pentagon Papers type scenario. And in the 2000s, we were raising awareness about Thomas Drake's case, about Chelsea Manning, about WikiLeaks. So we've been on the issue of the FBI and uh, the Espionage Act for some time now. And I've also been working on a book about the history of the FBI as it relates to the US national security state. Uh, the last six years of Donald Trump's sort of feuding with the FBI has created a whole bunch of new complications with, with the issue. Uh, you have people who now believe the FBI can do no wrong and it's the savior of our democracy. And, and also people who don't even take sort of the Nixon advice that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal and believe when Donald Trump does it, that means it's not illegal. So it's been very difficult to have these decisions, discussions about the FBI and its abuse of national security powers. Uh, that's why when we were waiting to unseal the warrant from the mar lago raid, I kept saying to myself, please don't let it be the Espionage Act. Please don't let it be the Espionage Act. And unfortunately it was. And now we're having these sort of same very stilted, very strange discussions about uh, the Espionage Act through the lens of Donald Trump. And it's worth pointing out that while Donald Trump is neither a journalist nor a whistleblower, the provision under the Espionage Act, the, the warrant was based off of, was 793. This is the section that has been used to go against journalists and whistleblowers like those in our panel today. He was not charged or not, or the warrant wasn't based on the provision of the Espionage Act section 794 that requires you to have given the information to a foreign power, the uh, provision used to convict the Rosenbergs and Robert Hansford. And he wasn't charged under, what the, he wasn't uh, rated based on a, a law governing atomic uh, secrets that two uh, people who gave atomic information to Brazil were convicted under in West Virginia earlier this year. You may have missed that strange spy case. Uh, so to discuss the very strange situation we're in now and setting the record straight about whether or not Donald Trump has faced an unprecedented double standard or whether or not the Espionage Act is our friend now. We have a really great panel today. We have Thomas Drake. Thomas is an Air Force veteran and former senior executive at the National Security Agency. After attempting to go through internal channels with concerns about surveillance, waste, fraud, and abuse, he provided non-classified information to a Baltimore Sun reporter. In 2010, he was the first whistleblower in decades to be indicted under the Espionage Act, although that part of the government's prosecution fell apart. We have John Kariaku. John is a former CIA analyst and case officer and a former senior investigator for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and former counterterrorism consultant. He is the author of the book, the Reluctant Spy, My Secret Life in the CIA's War on Torture. He was the first person to publicly confirm the CIA was engaged in waterboarding. And to this day, he remains the only person to go to prison in connection with the CIA torture program. And that was not for being trained in or authorizing the tactics or for blowing the whistle on them. And uh, I also have to say that John, I ran into him at the Roger Waters concert last night. And they told me this tiny tote bag I had was, was too small. <laughs> but John and his expert CIA training helped me smuggle it in, in this hat. Um, <laughs> that was a real CIA covert action we had going there. The bag is so big, it fits in this hat. I was terrified they were going to make me take my hat off at the security checkpoint. But but John had John had no plan. Uh, so... Last but not least, Jessalyn Radick. Uh, Jessalyn heads the Whistleblower and Source Protection Program, Whisper, at Exposed Facts. Her work focuses on the issues of secrecy, surveillance, torture, and drones, where she has been at the forefront of challenging government's unprecedented war on whistleblowers. Her clients include both John and Tom, as well as Daniel Hale and Edward Snowden. All right, let's get this channel started. Um, 
Tom, I want to start with you because a lot has been made about the, I guess you can call it a raid of Mar-a-Lago, although many people have had their homes uh, raided by the FBI would perhaps dispute that characterization. Your home itself was raided uh, as part of a 793 related investigation. What was that experience like and how does it compare to what we know Donald Trump went through? Well, I, it's, it was quite different. I mean, yes, it's a search warrant based raid. I mean, obviously they, they got their warrant. Uh, they had a warrant in my case, but uh, in my case, the reason I call it a raid and not, not calling what they did to Trump and Nora Lago a raid, because obviously Trump wasn't there. I was at my residence. I, it, they were loaded for bear. I mean, they pulled up from multiple directions. You know, they're streaming across my front lawn. They're securing the property. Um, they're banging really, really loudly on the door. Um, I found out later that they actually had a, one of those uh, RAM devices. Uh, they actually told me that if I hadn't answered the door, which is my son who actually answered the door, that they were going to bust the door down. Then I could actually uh, submit for damages later through some bureaucratic paperwork. Um, uh, it was not pleasant at all. Um, I was secured, to say it that way. I had my Miranda rights read. Um, they asked about weapons in the house, uh, including guns and knives. Um, they immediately uh, put uh, designators in each of the rooms. This is standard practice um, on a on a search warrant. But we're talking national security. I remember I I was the target in terms of that particular investigation, which had been ongoing for some time. Now there are a lot of similarities but it was much more a mild visit um, that was all arranged, obviously, uh, in cooperation with the Secret Service as well. I mean, even Trump had his own lawyers there, at least one that we know of for sure, um, in his absence uh, to represent him. Um, so it's a, it was a very different experience. Uh, it was designed to, uh, to really uh, to send fear. It was designed uh, to really uh, chill the air. Um, in fact, they tipped off the media. Uh, one of the things that I also experienced is during the raid of my residence, uh, major media outlets actually showed up uh, on the edge of my property out on the main out on the main road. And they even had an FBI spokesperson who stood up stood at the head of my driveway to explain in in summary detail, uh, what was going on, and they actually talked about it being a national security uh, investigation. And it was a, it was on the news, the local news, broadcast news at the top of the hour that evening, top of the hour late in the evening, and top of the hour the following morning. Unlike with Trump, where they were completely silent, and the only way we found out about it was Donald Trump had to get on the internet and let us all know. Uh, but then again, I mean, I'm the first to acknowledge I'm not a, I'm not the former president. I mean, we're talking <laughs> very, yes, I was a senior executive, but it was nowhere near the level of president. I mean, it's, you know, he's, he was the former top executive uh, officer um, at the very tippy top of the pyramid. So they're not going to go there's no question i mean there's some there is some real interesting dynamics in terms of the seriousness of going so far as to make a choice and it was obviously approved by attorney general um garland in order for him to actually go after um trump in this manner and it looked there was all kinds of as we're now finding out and have found out in some sub subsequent to the actual search warrant visit right uh, that there was a lot of back and forth had been ongoing for some time. And obviously it's already, it's also tied up in the Presidential Records Act, which is a whole nother dynamic and overlay that's uh, playing itself out in this manner as well. Not just the quote unquote, very sensitive or highly classified uh, documents uh, that apparently were not returned, all were taken, but not all returned. And I can tell you, this is the one thing, uh, once they set their me hooks in you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use that term uh, almost literally, they just don't let go. There's just no way, especially when it comes to uh, this these types of uh, when you're talking about probable cause and what they're looking for. Uh, in my case, I know precisely why they came to my house because I ultimately ended up discovering and getting a copy of the affidavit. The affidavit 
uh, and we may talk more about that, that really details how they frame the narrative in terms of going before the judge, typically a magistrate judge, to obtain the probable cause warrant. Uh, John, you also were indicted under the Espionage Act, but you ended up moving to a different statute. What were your dealings with the FBI like? Was there a raid of your house? How did they treat you? Uh, yeah, there was a raid of my house. I was not home. My wife was home with our six-week-old son, and uh, she was made to sit on the couch and not move. Uh, they were only in my house for two hours. They took all of my electronics, my desktop, my laptop, my, my late mother's laptop that they found in a, in a storage closet. Uh, they took uh, uh, all of the business cards that I had uh, that I had exchanged with people. They took uh, CDs and DVDs and thumb drives and everything that could have media stored on it. Uh, that was the first time they raided my house. The second time they raided my house, they were there for seven and a half hours. And then in the end, never charged me with a crime. But they they overturned my potted plants. They smashed a hole in the wall of my kitchen with a sledgehammer. Uh, they did all kinds of damage. And then told me, tough luck. Never charged me with a crime. I think it depends a little bit on the crew that you get. Uh, but I learned the first time what to do and what not to do in a situation like this. What you do is you say, I'm represented by counsel and I will not answer any of your questions. I had to say that three times, but they finally got the message. And that is very important advice. Never talk to the FBI without counsel. I think Jessalyn uh, would, would agree with that very strongly. Uh, Jessalyn, you've represented a, a number of clients who have been whistleblowers either invited or expected to investigate the Espionage Act, uh, not just Tom Brown. What have been some of their experiences like when the FBI raids their houses? Is it the sort of hands-off experience Trump got, or is it or is it very different from that? You know, I think most of the time um, people have been home and had their lives disrupted. Reality winner was at home when her raid occurred and she was guarded by, I mean, it was all male agents who insisted on watching her go to the bathroom, like go escort her to the bathroom and staying in there. I mean, it was really creepy stuff and separating her from her pets, not letting her have her rescue pet with her. I mean, it was heavy handed. It's, I, I don't think raids are the kind of kid glove treatment no that Trump got where you get notified ahead of time and things are negotiated and they tell you what they're looking for. And there are these back and forths. And I get that he was a president. It's unclear if they think to me, if they think he took the information um, and, and held on to it while he was president or somehow secreted away after he had lost the election. It's unclear temporarily. Um, when this would have happened. But normally, I mean, he definitely got kid glove treatment compared to what most Espionage Act defendants do. And most of them um, that I know have ended up being utterly traumatized by, by be going through the search and by having their house completely tossed and by trumped up, no pun intended, charges um, and, and things that are very innocuous in their house being turned into some sort of government contraband that, that violates secrecy laws. Um, it's a very difficult experience and it's very hard to understand what's going on in these cases because everything is usually locked down in secrecy. So even like as we're seeing now, as people try to get the affidavit in support of the warrant. Um, even the Justice Department is like, nope. And, and Trump is the one saying, yeah, I'd like to see that. We should see that. And they're like, nope, it'll give away the case. So. And they're oftentimes like heavily armed. I, I believe when, I think it was Bill Binney when they raided his house, you know, they pulled him out of the shower at gun, or maybe I'm imagining that. Yeah. I don't know. They pulled him out of the shower naked at gunpoint. Um, they you Yes, he's a double amputee. Um, at that point, I don't know how much of 
different body parts had been amputated because it occurred in stages. But yes, he was pulled naked from the shower. Um, I mean, these are, as Tom said, not gentle, delicate raids that you get to kind of negotiate the terms of your search and seizure with the FBI. These are surprise raids. They are meant to terrorize and scare you. Um, they often have a very lasting traumatic effect on the people who've been through them. Daniel Hill, Tom, John have all talking about like the PTSD, the literal chronic anxiety that it triggers. Um, even if you've done nothing wrong, even if you're eventually completely exonerated, the damage is done. It's meant to send a message to other people. And the fact that normally they have the camera crews ready and waiting, that goes into the premeditation that the government engages in to make sure that not only are you rated, but that the world knows about it. So they love to spread derogatory information about, about the subject. I mean, I know John and Tom can talk about that a little bit more. Um, for my next question, I, I want to get into the what is the Espionage Act? Um, I did a live stream for Kevin Gastolos at the center on Sunday. He made me watch all of these uh, meet the press clips of people explaining what the Espionage Act was. And uh, I heard one person say, um, for them to have gotten the warrant, there has to be probable cause like videotaped evidence of Trump giving information to foreign agents. I, I believe I just, I just put my hands in my head. I was like, no, 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 no. Um, and so there are different parts of the Espionage Act, including the one that the Rosenberg, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Section 793, Jesslyn. What is Section 793 of the Espionage Act and what is required to, to convict someone under it? <laughs> what is required to convict? I mean, this is a strict liability law. Um, that means like a retention or disclosure of information occurred. It doesn't matter. I mean, despite the term espionage, which is very misleading, this is about closely held national defense information. Um, it doesn't have to be classified. In a number of cases, like Tom Drake's, the information was unclassified. Um, for other people, it's been classified at very low levels. There are a bunch of different levels of classification beyond confidential, secret, top secret, sensitive, compartmented. There, there are some, I believe, 100 hybrid categories of sensitive but public for your, for government eyes only. For these, I mean, there are so many different levels that people don't know about. The problem with the Espionage Act and the part that has been used so much against whistleblowers is that, I mean, it's it's so heavy handed, strict liability, it's mired in secrecy and it doesn't require that you actually gave this information to anybody. If probably, I think the most analogous case might be that of Hal Martin, um, who was more someone who appeared to have almost a hoarding disorder and was compulsively keep taking documents home and keeping them, um, some of which were not even classified at a high level, some of which were no longer even relevant and just years old or things that had shut down. Um, and that's part of the problem with this, with this law. Also, you can't raise any kind of defense like oh, I mistakenly took that home, or oh, when I took it home, it was not classified and it was retroactively classified. Or, um, you know, I took this home, you know, in my case, I wasn't charged under the Espionage Act, but I took home this document because the government had destroyed it and I had to resurrect it on my computer and I was afraid it would be destroyed again. None of those issues are allowed to be introduced under the Espionage Act. So I... I and again, there's no public interest defense um, that you, you know, in the case of most of the people this has been used on, they're whistleblowers and they did not take home information for fame or profit or revenge or, I mean, they took it home because it was in the public interest to know and the government had destroyed it, lied about it covered it up, uh, and, you know, a bunch of other nefarious reasons to hide embarrassment at best and often stuff that turned out to be illegal, like torture, domestic secret surveillance, war crimes, 
election interference by the Russians. These are all reasons that whistleblowers uh, ended up getting charged under the Espionage Act. Um, and there are a number of actual people convicted of spy-esque crimes who were not charged under the Espionage Act. So it is very, it's a very blunt instrument in the government's arsenal of tools that it can use on people. And I, you know, I, like I said, I am not a Donald Trump fan, but I don't think the Espionage Act should be used on anyone because it is so deeply flawed. I would hate to see it legitimized in any kind of way because of Trump's unpopularity and and just blatant mishandling of so much so many things in the government, including documents. I would hate to see suddenly people who've been against the Espionage Act um, now rooting for it. It's very jarring to see that because again, it's not a law that should be used against anyone. Period. I mean, unfortunately, as someone who is writing a book on, on the FBI and who works for an organization that FBI reform has been one of our biggest topics since, you know, we were a victim of Cointel for always. We feel very strongly about the FBI. I mean, we've seen that happen with, with the FBI throughout the Trump years is that because uh, there were so many criminal investigations against Trump, some of them I think were rather legitimate, some of them I think less so. Uh, we, we've just seen people lionizing the FBI and equating any sort of... Um, uh, attack on the FBI with, with treason or or being a Trump supporter. And we already saw this situation where, where Senator Rand Paul, I, I think he was being very cynical, uh, but he shared an article from 2019 about repealing the espionage act and how it was used in World War One. And, and, you know, clearly his timing is about the Trump raid, but the article from 2019, there's nothing in it that was false. And obviously, defending rights consent is, is non-partisan. We have no no thoughts on on elections. I don't I don't even know elections are happening. Um, and and you saw his opponent saying, Rand Paul wants to repeal the Espionage Act. If I'm elected, you won't have to question my loyalty. You know, and as someone who has, as people know, have been involved in a very long term and very uphill process of trying to get members of Congress to reform the Espionage Act, including the least recent. Uh, to leave Omar Amendment. I mean, is this the level of discourse now that if you want to repeal the Espionage Act, it's because you want to be a spy and you love Donald Trump? And, you know, we've seen that happen with the FBI. And if that happens with the Espionage Act, it is really unfortunate because it is happening at a time where after the Assange prosecution, there is momentum in our favor. And I'm really terrified we lost it. Tom, you were the signature Espionage Act prosecution of the Obama era. Um, the Espionage Act charge against you obviously fell apart. Could you explain a little bit what the government had alleged you had done and, and what happened in your case? Well, in summary, uh, I was the target of a uh, national security investigation that was launched uh, because the press, in this case, the New York Times, had published a blockbuster above the fold upper left corner of the paper. I mean, it was, you know, it's, we're talking the news as it were all, it's fit to print. And this had to do with the so-called warrantless wiretapping program. It was an article written by James Risen um, and Eric Licklau. And that launched a massive, a massive leak investigation in which I got caught up. And the fact remains, uh, very few people know this, I became the target of that investigation, which means they actually raided a number of other people, a very small number of other people. And I, as I understand, was the final, the final raid um, because I, they had this gigantic uh, bullseye and they were looking for evidence to prove um, that, you know, I had classified information and that's why they visited me. Um, so, what they were looking for was evidence, uh, which later turned into an indictment, okay, two and a half years later. It took them two and a half years to figure out how to indict me, even though it was pretty clear that they were working on that. There'd been a grand jury as well that had been established, uh, lo looking uh, for evidence that would prove that I had violated the Espionage Act. And of course, other than the Morrison and the APAC case, I, I mean, I was literally the first uh, whistleblower since Ellsberg who've been charged in like manner, meaning for non-spy activities. Uh, historically, 
uh, the Espionage Act, uh, although there's a couple other minor cases, even going back to World War II, uh, had been used to go against more traditional spying. Um, um, but the basis, ironically enough, is was coming full was coming full circle, uh, where because I did in fact um, go to the press in my case, even though I was cooperating with multiple government investigations in terms of 9/11 uh, and and other investigations, intelligence failures, um, the uh, why did NSA miss the signals, etc., and and a lot of um, massive fraud, waste and abuse in the billions and billions of dollars. I ultimately did go to the press. And it's important to note that in practically all of these cases, particularly from Obama on, the press is actually implicated. Um, and in fact, they considered the reporter that I went to at the time, an national security reporter, uh, who was actually writing for, at the time for the Baltimore Sun, which is really the paper of record for NSA. Um, uh, that uh, was essentially the only eyewitness to a crime. And so they were looking for uh, the evidence. Uh, in my case, it didn't matter that it was unclassified. There is the provision in 793 that uh, the, what, it's a weird term, mishandling, right? The mishandling. But they added an interesting phrase, which is not even in law, right? This is where they sort of give themselves license to be creative in terms of uh, why they're going after you, which was for the purpose of disclosure. And so there is this whole dynamic, and this is what, which is also applies to what happened at Mar-a-Lago. This is where the national security establishment is really hyper. I'm just gonna really emphasize this, that if information, whether it's classified or not, as Jesslyn po pointed out quite succinctly, national defense information there is no word called classified in the, the original 790 uh, the act there is a 798 that came along during the national security act uh, update uh, in 1950 but ndi can pretty much cover the waterfront it could be uh i think just you might even uh recipes that were generated within within an agency could they have a stamp of classified on there because it, it was actually created with, by someone that was inside the building. Um, so they were looking for evidence. And in fact, as my case went on, um, they retroactively classified what was all, what was what was classified or asserted, attempted to assert before the judge that everything was born classified uh, because it had originated from NSA. I had stolen it, sound familiar, in terms of Trump, right? This, these, this is where it's sort of surreal for me in terms of sort of the parallels they do not like what I'm going to call spillage, meaning the chance that something goes outside of a protected area, which, which you know, there's a whole protocol that's all controlled by the executive branch. This is not congressional by, by any means, shape or form, or even law. It's all executive order driven, um, where you have all of, all of these procedures for how you contain various types of information, both classified and unclassified. So they, you know, they, and the irony in my case is I actually went through the procedures. It's clear that Trump didn't. Um, this, this is another dynamic. I went through the procedures for ensuring that what, when I cleared my office at NSA and I was teaching at the National Defense University, I had to go through the security officer to carefully go through what was going to be kept, what was going to, what was unclassified, what was going to be going to, to the history, uh, to the history uh, department and section at NSA, colleagues, et cetera, depending on what it was. Some stuff was highly classified, but I was uh, authorized, I actually was, to take out a small amount, so it was a few boxes of stuff, uh, that was patently unclassified. It didn't matter, it didn't matter to the government, okay? So, because they found this outside of NSA. In fact, they said that I had been, quote unquote, collecting this information since at least 2002, which is actually a blatant lie. Um, so that's why they came after me. The affidavit, uh, which paints a, a really, really dark picture of me, going back to this whole narrative of Al Qaeda, 9/11, and threats to national security, painted me as someone who was going to was really a really, really bad dude, um, and that I had uh, essentially I had negative intent when it came to what they had discovered, and they claimed 
that what I had, no kidding, this is what they actually asserted uh, in the narrative of the indictment two and a half years later, that, that ex I caused, could cause exceptionally grave damage uh, to the national security of the United States, which was the farthest thing uh, from reality. I was actually a whistleblower. So it's important to note, not only did they go after me because I was a whistleblower, they went after me because I was actually exposing government wrongdoing and violations of the Fourth Amendment, the epigenesis of what became known as the, the mass surveillance regime, uh, as well as 9-11 uh, intelligence failures and, and billions in fraud, waste, and abuse. Uh, John, you also were initially indicted under the Espionage Act. You pled to a, a different statute, the um, Intelligence and Enemies Protection Act. What was the role of the Espionage Act in your case? What was the government alleging? Yeah, I was charged with three counts of espionage. The government alleged that I had um, exposed the torture program to uh, two reporters at ABC News and one reporter to the New York Times. And, you know, the, the irony is that when I blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program in December of 2007, the uh, CIA uh, asked the, the Justice Department to do an investigation. They filed what's called a crimes report against me. And um, the Justice Department investigated me from December of 07 to December of 08 and then determined that I had not committed a crime. They said that the espionage, I'm sorry, they said that the torture program was uh, the worst kept secret in Washington. Everybody knew that there was a torture program. Uh, Human Rights Watch had reported on it, Amnesty International, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Everybody had talked about it. They had written about it. They had published about it. And so they elected to not uh, prosecute me. In fact, they sent my lead attorney a declination letter declining to prosecute me. What I didn't know was that four weeks later, when Barack Obama became president, John Brennan, who uh, was the deputy national security advisor, went on to be CIA director, asked the Justice Department to secretly reopen the case against me. So it all came back to these two interviews, one with ABC News, in which I said that the CIA was torturing its prisoners, and a follow-up interview with uh, the New York Times. It was as simple as that. And Brennan was also the CIA director when they broke into Senate staffers' computers who were investigating the torture program, correct? And he also pushed the Justice Department to investigate the ACLU John Adams project. He was very You're much- You're absolutely right. Very in, much- In fact, in the very beginning, I was accused of being the source for the John Adams project. Or John Adams? Sam Adams, what was it? John uh, Adams was John the- Adams. See, and, and, and I, I, oh, yeah. I said to them, I, I never heard of this program. I don't know what you're talking about. But uh, but they persisted until, you know, they finally admitted that there was no evidence that uh, that I was I was the source. And, you know, at the same time, Jess, you'll remember this. There was a disgruntled former CIA officer living in Bethesda, Maryland, who had a website in, on which he just bashed the CIA. He exposed the names of seven covert officers on this website and was never charged with a crime. And when I asked my lead attorney, how have they fallen on my head like a ton of bricks, but they don't even charge this guy with a crime? And my attorney said very matter of factly, that guy didn't blow the whistle on the CIA's torture program. So I think yeah, that from, it's from selective, Justin malicious, Tom. and vindictive. They want to make an example of That's you. That's right. And you know, if you're if you're not a Petraeus. You can still be quite senior, but if you're not a Petraeus or politically connected or have a sugar mama or sugar daddy, uh, guess what? And I know in my case, I found out later, Cheney said, just burn somebody, fry somebody, make an example of them. I became the person. They had to find someone to punish for the quote unquote spillage, and I'm going to say this word again, of the mass surveillance regime. That was the thing that they were protecting. It was a super secret you know, state secret, I mean, of all the state secrets that are out there. And so I became the person it was going to bear the sins of the state because I dared expose cr crimes committed by the state. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things that uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who campaigned for a, a pardon of Samuel Morrison, who uh, was 
for a brief period, the only person convicted under the Espionage Act. Uh, in his letter to Bill Clinton, which is really worth interesting, he said that uh, Morrison did something that was routine in Washington. He leaked classified information in order to influence public policy discussions. The only thing exceptional about the crime was that it was prosecuted under the Espionage Act. So these are absolutely selective uh, prosecutions. Why then do you think they're using 793? I know I'm asking you to speculate. Uh, why then do you think they're using 793 with, with the Trump case? May I jump into that? Of course, John. Yeah. I, I think it's in part uh, because of something that happened in my case. In, in my very first uh, hearing, my attorneys got up and cited Tom Drake's case, saying that Tom had no criminal intent, even if he had done what they accused him of doing, which we know he didn't do. But even if he had, he had no criminal intent. And in my case, Judge Lena Brinkema said that she was choosing to not respect that precedent. And my lawyer said, Your Honor, are you saying that a person can accidentally commit espionage? And she said, that's exactly what I'm saying. And she looked at me and she said, Mr. Kiriakou, you either did it or you didn't do it. And it was as simple as that. So that one decision on that one day made pretty much everybody in America with a security clearance uh, liable for a, an Espionage Act prosecution. Yeah. If you happen to have a document, a single page that the government can legitimately call or, or semi-legitimately call national defense information, you can be charged with espionage, no matter how absurd it might be. Yeah, and they went so far in my case, Chip. I mean, Jess, you're gonna, I, want you to, I want you to weigh in on this, because I think there's a larger context here, uh, especially given I was a signature case where they tried all kinds of stuff, as you well know, uh, because it, it had been such a long time, you have to go really go back to Ellsberg uh, for anything even close. They got to the point as their case was collapsing, although the public didn't know this at the time, right? This is like almost 12, you know, we're talking 12, 13 months later. They actually argued, okay, so none of it's classified, but it deserves the same protection as if it were. It's protected information because it's owned by the government. Well, it also argued that, well, even if it was unclassified, Tom Drake should have known that it should have been classified. And I know that sounds very Kafkaesque, but it is. I mean, when it comes to intent, many courts had recognized it, that the Espionage Act was an incredibly problematic law. So I believe it was back during the APAC cases when one of the judges grafted on an intent requirement yeah. to try to keep this very problematic law within the bounds of the Constitution. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, yeah. over the years, that that intent requirement has been whittled away, and now you can only bring up your intent at sentencing, which means you've already been found guilty. So at sentencing, you can say, I gave it to the newspaper because I thought the government was engaged in wrongdoing or because the government lied, blatantly lied about this program or the government, I mean, in Daniel Hale's case, you know, lied about, you know, they had this overbroad targeting of drone strikes and they lied about the number of civilian casualties. And I, I, you, you can explain yourself, but by then the damage is already done. And you can only hope that you have like a Judge O'Grady rather than like in John's case, uh, Judge Brinkema, or in Tom's case, he also um, had, had a good judge, Judge Bennett, um, you know, who, who exercised like a little bit of reasonableness and trying to discern like what motive was. Yeah, in my understanding with the APAC case, with the intent provision, I mean, it's the, the Franklin case, and Franklin is a State Department employee, and then there's the two APAC lobbyists, and the intent provision, the heightened intent, was only for the two APAC lobbyists. The uh, Franklin part of the Franklin case went to prison and was convicted, and the APAC case fell apart either due to politics or the official uh, explanation was that 
the elevated intent for non-government employees. Mm-hmm. So, so sort of the 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 precedent here. I mean, it's a. I don't think you went to an appellate court, so it might not be binding. Is that there's a a, a different intent standard for government employees versus non-government employees? Because because the the letter of the law, and I know that's not how it functions. The letter of the law is this sort of specific intent or reason to believe, and they they use the non-disclosure agreement and all of the yeah. classes training to argue you know you had reason to believe because we told you bad things would happen if you did this but when you have someone who has never signed a non-disclosure agreement who has never sat through those trainings someone like like myself or the APAC lobbyist or Julian Assange um you know it, it's an open question as to what the government needs to to and I don't want it to be answered because I'm afraid of how how our current course will do so but it is a little bit more of a a wild card question. Uh, one of the things, even before we went live on this broadcast, we started getting a lot of pushback about was that the classification system is through the executive branch, that the president can declassify uh, anything he wants, um, and that therefore Donald Trump cannot have uh, broken the Espionage Act. Uh, either Tom or, or John, would one of you want to want to address sort of what is the classification system? Is it a statutory authority? Is it an executive authority? Who is who is the final decider? It's it's really driven by the executive branch, uh, you know, with the president at the top. It is true, um, and I, I'll give you an example here in a moment that the president uh, one doesn't have a security clearance by definition. He's the president, so he can pretty much see anything at any time. He, obviously, he's briefed in on some of the uh, some of the nation's uh, most secret secrets. Uh, there is a thing I used to help support it uh, when I was um, in the military, in the, in the uh, both both in the military navy as well as uh, as a civilian um, at the CIA, supporting the presidential daily brief. You know where you feed up information, and some ultimately may have ended up or did end up um, in this daily brief that the president uh, sees, and that's pretty much a compilation of what is the most secret secrets that only a few eyes can actually see um, and in very, very, very close hold as, as well. So if he decides, right, that something is declassified, yeah, he can say that, but there is a procedure by which that then goes through declassification, right? It, it, in, in essence, it actually accelerates the declassification procedures that are uh, delineated in a number of different. Uh, there's it depends on it depends on the agency, it depends on the level of classification, it depends on access and all that other stuff. So I'm going to give you an example, but you can't just say later or as a blanket. Oh no, I just waved my hand over it and it became you know de- that's like the government arguing in my case that oh I should have known it was already classified, but just because it didn't have any markings on it, right? course, Trump is arguing the, in the other, right? Well, if, you know, I'm the president. So um, Reagan, uh, KL007, 1983. Um, and this, this was actually a significant point of contention. I was in the Air Force at the time, my other military service, uh, where he actually revealed what normally would have been highly classified um, spillage, if it were if it just went out without any kind of authorization, you get in this authorization, what's authorized and unauthorized, uh, communication between uh, the fighter um, that, that actually ended up shooting down KL-77 and the ground controllers. They actually released uh, actual por- a portion, both the actual communication and the transcript um, uh, it, that was in Russian. Um, it, it, caught, it was quite controversial, but given the political dynamics and the fact that it was an actual airliner, um, that was a decision of made. So in essence, he had that authority um, to do so. You, but to say that I can just wave my magic presidential wand uh, across a bunch of stuff that I took over, and I think it was several months plus and then some, uh, and, and whisk it away, spirit it away to a beach house in South Florida, and then when I get caught, you know, claim that it was, uh, it's now unclassified. Well, that's really, really convenient, isn't it? And I'm, I, my concern, I'm going to say it right now. This is the irony. And this is sort of what's surreal for me, uh, for all of you and even the audience. There are portions of the Espionage Act that are legit. They really are. And in fact, I think some of this is legit as it would apply or potentially applies 
or the exposure that Trump, Trump is facing. I mean, we're talking in some cases, no matter what you think about policy, uh, when it comes to you know nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, apparently there was nuclear stuff mixed in in all this. Yeah, I mean we're we're talking about stuff that really, really is must be controlled. You can't just have it wandering around in some location where people can come in and out and look and look at it. If, if it's like sort of like a carnival atmosphere almost, where I get to keep it, but I'm the one that gets to say, hey watch this look at this i'm not an expert in the atomic energy act but i believe i mean if you espionage act even if you can say okay well intent doesn't matter i think with the atomic energy act the, the stuff governing the nuclear information his intent might be very relevant um yeah yeah so been a while since I've read it when they had that very strange spy trial in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. People were accused of giving atomic secrets or nuclear secrets. Uh, people at first thought it was France. It turned out it was Brazil. So already a very bizarre case. Um, I, I started reading the Atomic Energy Act, which does carry life in prison, but not the death sentence. So that was one of the last minute appeals in the Rosenberg case from yeah. the rogue lawyer uh, who... Um, argued that they should have been charged under the atomic energy, which carries life, but not death, um, but still more serious than 793. Um, and and I, I do think the intent was a little bit higher because this was when we were fooling around with trying, you and I, Justin, were fooling around with trying to uh, mess with the intent provision in 793, and I was looking at that as an example. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, and, and, and you know, like, like Tom said, I mean, there's a lot illegitimate in the Espionage Act uh, but there are some things that I, I do think are secrets. I mean, one of the sure. things that people online have speculated, and I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to bring up any speculation, but is that, you know, he was potentially trying to pass nuclear secrets to yeah. the Saudis. If he is trying to pass nuclear secrets to one of the most repressive regimes on Earth, I mean, I don't think we should be proliferating nuclear weapons. I, I sure as hell don't think we should let the Saudis have them. Uh, you know, I, I think there should be a criminal consequence for that. I mean, maybe I'm a a, a, a right-wing police state apologist now, but I, I, I think that if you uh, are giving nuclear secrets to the Saudis, you um, should at least have to pick up some trash on the side of the road or something. John, do nope. you know on the classification system? Yeah, I wanted to say one thing about the classification system. You know, when I was at the CIA, literally everything was classified. Yeah. If I if I sent yep. an email to my wife yep. saying, do you want to have lunch? I would classify it secret no form, secret no foreigners. <laughs> and I would um, I would use as the authority uh, HUM 4-82, human intelligence. It wasn't human intelligence. It wasn't classified. But that's just the culture. Literally everything is classified. And then she would email me back, sure, let's meet for lunch in front of the deli. And that would be classified at the secret level as well. Well, it, that stuff shouldn't be classified. But the thing is, is there's no oversight whatsoever for, for classification. And so we end up with billions and billions of pages of documents, many of which are improperly classified. I argued from the very beginning in the reality winner case that what reality was accused of releasing shouldn't have been classified in the first place because it didn't contain any classified information. It wasn't derived from classified information, yeah. sources and methods. It was just analysis. It was an analyst's opinion about a story that was in the news. You know, there's an irony, uh, Chip. Did you know in the executive, you know, there was these executive orders that govern all this, even in, in the non-disclosure agreements, but in the executive orders that the penalties for misclassifying or classifying to cover wrongdoing, administrative inefficiencies, violations of the law, threats of public safety or health, which are sort of the classic whistleblower, right? In terms of exposure, no one has ever been held accountable for having quote unquote misclassified a document. It's only if you quote unquote spill in an unauthorized, remember unauthorized yet to be determined by the authorities, right? Um, especially if you're unauthorized, right? Then yeah, well, hey, we're gonna throw the book at you. 
And I want to, I, I think it's also important here, and this is sort of what's interesting. I mean, Trump's is dominating the news and, and the social media right now. In some ways, as much as he was or more than when he was president. I mean, we're a caught up in a soap opera, right? We really are a national security soap opera involving Trump and his, his ego and his echo chambers and everything else. I mean, that's a whole nother dynamic. May, may but I we're talking about to... boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes. We're talking about dozens of boxes jam packed with all manner, including stuff that's ECI, which some people don't talk about. This is exceptionally controlled information. This is like the most sensitive beyond like SAP SAR, which is special access program or special access require, which I was familiar with based on my military background. And this is sitting in rooms and his office and his safe, you know, at Mar-a-Lago, I mean, you know, he doesn't have a big enough moat, you know, to protect him. I don't know. It's just, I just find the whole thing to be totally hypocritical. Um, and it's, and it's not just Trump. I think you're, you were alluding to it, Chip, that there's people now all of a sudden you're for the Espionage Act. This, this, if there was any act, especially just talk about being strict liability, that's unconstitutional. What chance did John and I have, right? I, I escaped, barely escaped from going to prison. John knows what it's like to go to prison. I'm the only one other than Ellsberg, and, and of course Snow's an exception because he's in, in Russia, that did not end up being convicted or end up being in prison as a result of the original charge under the Espionage Act. I mean, I'm well aware of how rare it is to stay free. It's and it involves the press. If you, Chip, you know better than we do. I think in terms of the history, Eugene Debs, all the war yeah. protesters, not just at the end of World War One. We have to go back to the origin stories. The espionage. I understand this was designed to suppress dissent. This was designed to put a stranglehold on the First Amendment, which again, the only only part of the Constitution, the Amendment, where Congress shall pass no law. You cannot abridge it. This abridges the First Amendment. John, do you have, were you about to say I, I did. I wanted to add one thing. Um, I wanted to talk really briefly about how quickly this whole, uh, the, the, the way the law is viewed has changed over the years. In 1997, I had just returned from uh, an overseas tour. I was working at the CIA and a woman that I sat next to had an affair with a former CIA officer who had become a, a commentator at CNN. And in the course of, of pillow talk, she revealed <laughs> classified information to him that he then broadcast on CNN. So the CIA did a security investigation. They were able to pin it on her. And she confessed to having provided classified information that he then uh, broadcast on CNN. What was her punishment? She was not charged under the Espionage Act. Instead, she had a letter put in her personnel file. She was suspended without pay for four weeks. And she was not allowed to be promoted for 12 months. That was her punishment. How did things change so dramatically yeah. in that short five-year period from 1997 until Tom Drake's case. It's just, it's just insane to me. And because most Americans don't follow these issues, there really hasn't been any objection. Yeah, and one of the things that was mentioned was that, I mean, you're not supposed to be classifying information to conceal wrongdoing, but there's no way in an espionage act to raise a challenge. I mean, in the Daniel Hale Case, one of the motions the government put forward that was granted was that they could not uh, challenge proper classification of documents on two grounds. Ground one was that only the executive branch can determine whether or not something is provided, a court cannot, which is mind boggling. And argument two was that even if they were illegally or wrongfully classified, the Espionage Act does not pertain only to. Uh, correctly classified information, but wrongfully classified information as well. Uh, yep. It's classified illegally or legally, and you're still you're still guilty. 
Um, the last thing I want to talk about, because we're, we're running out of time, this was a really great conversation. I, we could probably stay here for another few hours, I, I imagine, with four of us. Um, Just getting started, Chip. I know, I know you are, Tom. I know you are. That's why I'm uh, giving you the time. Uh, yeah. But um, is that how secret these proceedings are? I mean, in the in the Leibowitz oh, case, yeah. um, the judge concedes he does not know what the information was that was given, who it was. This is a sentencing judge, who he gave it to, or what the impact of it was. But he knew it was, and he said the court is in the dark. But also that he knew it was a serious offense when giving out the sentencing, and and at the Daniel Hale uh, tr uh, sentencing, I mean there were two sections. One was classified, one was open one, and, and the three of us were at the open one. They actually in classified parts of the open proceeding, which I found out because I'm trying to uh, to FOIA get the DOD, the FBI, and the NSA and the DOJ to to release. Uh, information from the leak investigations, from the various information that was published, and they won't even confirm or deny that these leak investigations took place. And it's like, what do you mean you can confirm or deny that? I, I was sitting in the courtroom when the judge said the reporter's name. Okay, oh, but that reporter's name has now been redacted. It's reporter two, who we know what day he was on a panel with with tail on what day he published the articles, what they were about. Who could figure out reporter two is Jeremy Scahill, only only a, a super sleuth. So um <laughs> what what is what is the um what is what is the secrecy like as someone who has tried to litigate these cases? It's incredibly locked down. I mean if Julian Assange were to be extradited and tried here, um all of the pretrial stuff would largely take place in secret. It would be subject to the Classified Information Procedures Act. Um, certain words, even once you go to trial, you're not allowed to use actual words. Um, so like in Tom Drake's case, there were motions to preclude the use of the word whistleblower. Motions to preclude the use of the word fiber optic. I mean, these are everyday words and, and ones that would be pretty integral to the hearing. In one of Daniel Hale's hearings that was not classified, they would not let me stay in the courtroom. It was an insane, even crazier level of secrecy. I was like, um, you know, I know everything about this and that he's actually living at my house. I know you all know that. So, I mean, again, it was this theater of the absurd. And you have all of these Alice in Wonderland kind yeah. of fictions that are governing this stuff. Like you mentioned, obviously, in all these cases, it talks about, in Tom's case, Reporter A, Reporter B, in John's case. Like, everyone knew it was Matthew Cole. Everyone knew, it, you know, Jeremy Scahill. Everyone knew Siobhan Gorm. Like, people knew. It, I mean, it was not thinly disguised at all. And even yeah. the classification czar himself, much credit to Bill Leonard, who has continued to be super vocal on this, but he had been the classification czar for a very long time. And to his credit has spoken out on behalf of a number of defendants in these cases and even did like a Q and A about the, the problems with the Trump case. I mean, this is a very problematic law. The classification system, the government acknowledges it over classifies and has a huge classification problem and has in fact lost track of how much stuff it classified in the aftermath of 9-11. Yet these prosecutions continue to turn on that. You have to take the government's word for it. It's impossible to challenge. And that includes things that are so utterly challengeable like retroactive classification i mean any other retroactive law if you got a speeding ticket for going 40 miles an hour in a 30 mile hour zone and then they up they made it 15 miles an hour they can't charge you for going 30 miles an hour when it was 30 miles an hour i mean it's 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 lunacy. And a lot of people have pointed that out over the years. Yet this law now, what had been a one-off, unfortunately, is now become yeah. norm normalized. I mean, the whole pageantry of these, these show trials is that the information is so secret, so damning, it can't be released by anyone. And therefore, they can't actually, you know, acknowledge it 
I mean, they, they do too thinly just thin disguises, but like in the courtroom. So like as part of the show that they're putting on, they have to have Gordon Cromberg jump up and down and say, no judge, no judge. It's classified that the U.S. has drone operations in the Horn of Africa because no one they no went, one, Yeah. No they one knows. As, yeah. Sorry. Uh, but and and I do think with a case like Trump, where like there is a vested public interest in it being transparent, not just because of his supporters who think he's being persecuted, but for people who are his opponents but want to make sure that he is being treated, you know, not as a powerful person, but as as anyone would be. I mean, it's it just it, it seems like the worst possible law for our democracy to investigate a case that has this high of a level of, of, of requirement for transparency. Tom, do you have a, a final thought for us? Jess said it's used as a blunt instrument. That in many respects, uh, and I'm just looking at John now, uh, is an understatement, okay? Uh, they actually argued in my case that what I did was worse than a spy. Now, wait a minute. I thought the S.R. and Jack was designed to go after spies, not whistleblowers disclosing wrongdoing, right? This is the whole balance public interests, right? Nope, worse than a spy. Here's why. What you, quote unquote, kept for the purpose of disclosure ended up in the press. That means everybody gets to read it, including spies. That was part of their argument. And that I would have the blood of American soldiers on my hands. That was actually asserted in the courtroom uh, by the prosecution. So, you know, I mean, where do you stand? I mean, I, I faced, I ultimately pled out under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is kind of Espionage Act light, okay? Uh, because you have to stick to 18 USC. You can't go to, you know, the civilian code because you'd be either charged, you know, with 10 felony counts. So, yeah, it's, you're, you're put behind many, many eight balls and, you know, you become this, you know, you just, it turns your life. See, I, the, personal cost as john well knows just knows what she went through because she sort of what the upfront cost is even though she wasn't ultimately although the threat was there the threat was made uh but once you're you know charged i mean it was i still live the trauma i still live the aftermath i still live with the damage um that was caused because remember the federal government is really in doj as the instrument they literally can take your life away they can take your liberty away. They can severely, severely restrict your freedoms. Um, so it's, I just wish that the Espionage Act would go away. It never should have actually remained. It was a, what was, it was left over from World War One, but it never should have continued. And maybe that's the one good thing that can come out of this Trump situation. Maybe now enough Republicans will be so outraged that yeah. somebody with some guts might uh, yeah. move to to uh, to do away with it, to do away with uh, with seven ninety three, to amend it, to reform it, to do something with it. Because as it stands now, um, it's there just to serve as a cudgel to uh, yeah. to bash whistleblowers and implicate the press. Let's not forget. Yeah. That's right. The, the, it's only prosecutor discretion that has kept, although we've come close. Remember Ellsberg? Oh my gosh. I mean, and that was sort of left on the table. It was, it was no, there was no, there was no guarantee going forward, even after Ellsberg, because it was you know, prosecutorial misconduct is ultimately how, how Ellsberg was, was allowed to go free. He actually went to trial. It's two years plus. He didn't even talk about that very because it's like the worst two years of his life. I know what that's like, John. You know what it's like, right? All those pre-trial, you know, all that proceedings, and then just all dealing with all that. It was never actually taken off the table. The whole prior restraint. What if they reopen all that? There are those who want to. What happens? I mean, this is why the Julian Assange case I think is so crucial, because yes, he's not. He's a foreign national. He's not a U.S. citizen. But what's the difference? I mean, all kinds of secrets, quote unquote, are re are revealed, both authorized and unauthorized leaks, uh, to U.S. press outlets. What's to prevent? That's that is only because prosecutors have chosen not to because of the First Amendment implications. So you see, sort of the trend lines here. 
starting with my signature case, are not good because the press was directly implicated. They actually threatened, as they did in the Sterling case, where they subpoenaed Ryzen. They threatened, in my own case, to bring the reporter, Shabad Gorman, into the courtroom as, as a hostile witness against me because she was the only eyewitness to a national security crime. They chose, in the end, did not. Because the judge, they tried it, the judge said, we're not going to go down that. And he knew what the implications were. Uh, to the judge's Jessica, credit. Jessica, do you want to share your final thoughts? And then I'll, I'll wrap this up. Yeah, my final thoughts, again, are, yeah, I mean, I know there are numerous efforts to reform the Espionage Act, including ones that you're spearheading, Chip, which I support because they include adding a public interest defense. Um, but part of me fears that yeah. using this on Trump, who is so divisive, unfortunately, I see tons of armchair overnight experts on the Espionage Act and on classification. And 90% of them have no idea yeah. what they're talking about. This is a very nuanced, granular provision of a very complicated, antiquated, overbroad law. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think this is a loss for democracy, however you might feel about Donald Trump, um, however you might feel about Julian Assange this law is incredibly dangerous for much greater reasons than the personalities of the defendants that is being wielded against. I think that's an excellent point, uh, Jessalyn, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, there have been a lot of armchair experts and terrible analysis, which is why we put this program together to set the record straight. I want to have some people on who actually knew what they were talking about. I, I wish Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson or whoever else would, would, would do that. But um, you're stuck with me, guys, unfortunately. Um, but um, And if anyone out there is in Congress and is thinking this is so terrible what the FBI is doing to Trump with the Espionage Act, we at Defending Rights and Dissent have plenty of ready-to-go proposals that would dramatically curtail the power of the FBI, dramatically curtail the power of the Espionage Act. I'm a, I'm a little bit... Uh, displeased with these people who suddenly are long-term proponents of the security state and then they're they're now born again critics in the trump case but do nothing to actually uh move any of those reforms into law because there's a whole lot that could be being done uh, i want to thank all of you for joining us i want to thank our three guests and i want to invite you to visit us all online at rightsanddissent.org there's plenty of information about the espionage act uh, including other interviews with Thomas, John, and Jessalyn, longer ones than this, and plenty of information on the history of the FBI. Uh, so thank you for joining us, and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. Thank you.